before he left, he whispered to them, Todd is the only one here I can trust. Here he is at a dealership, and they, Miller said it was a busy day. There were lots of people, lots of activity going on there in the sales room, and there were probably 12 other salespeople working. And he said it was astounding that this young sales guy said, out of all these 12 other people, there's only one here that I can trust, not to try to steal something from me while he's helping you. Steal the sale and the commission that goes with it. Can't trust any of them. That's a little bit distressing, isn't it, to imagine that uh, it could be like that. People, you know, can be really kind of crummy. And here's a guy that says, I can't even trust my coworkers not to steal from me. People can be difficult. Where in Romans chapter 12, Paul had spent 11 chapters saying, here's what the gospel of Christ really is and defending it. And then in chapter 12, he begins saying, now let's talk about what that's going to mean in the way we live and practical, how do we put this into, into, into our daily lives? And a lot of it has had to do with relationships. And we've seen how much he's talked about how we can have true love relationships. And then this morning, he's going to continue on that theme and, and really talk about the fact that if you're in relationships with people, you're going to get hurt. And how do we deal with that? People can do some things that are really frustrating to us. You know, we have to, on Sunday mornings, we have all this equipment that we have to bring and set up in here. And so we, we got to pull in downstairs and then put all this stuff. And this morning it's a little bit easier because we don't have the big keyboard. But it's a lot of stuff to haul up to the third floor. And uh, so the problem is we don't want to have to go f carry it a long way through the parking garage downstairs. And so we always look for a parking space that's close to the elevators. But often, especially in the summer, there's none available. But the good news is right across from the elevator, they have a loading zone. You may have noticed that. One of the things that frustrates me, happened again today, is there is a motorcycle that is often parked right in front of the sign that says, loading zone, no parking. This guy parks his motorcycle and blocks the loading zone right there. And it's somebody who works here because it's there often, which means one of their employees goes and parks right in front of the no parking sign in the loading zone. What is wrong with you? You know, why is that there? It's there so that people can unload their stuff, not so you can park your stupid motorcycle. Excuse my bitterness. You know, people do stuff. How are we going to deal with that? This morning, we're going to look at a really key idea that Paul is going to give us. It's in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21, and here's what he says. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath for it is written, it is mine to revenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, how do we deal with it when people hurt us, when people are difficult, when they annoy us and they frustrate us? First thing, refuse to hit back. You know, one of the top shows on Amazon Prime this summer has been a show called a Terminal List. The Terminal List uh, was released at the beginning of July and within a couple of weeks shot to the uh, top 10, uh, right at the top of their top 10 list. Uh, the show is actually a series of eight episodes that focus on a uh, fictional Navy SEAL who leads his team on a mission in the Middle East and his entire team is killed in the course of the mission. He's the only one who survives. And very soon after that uh, devastating event, he figures out that could only happen if they were betrayed by someone in his chain of command. And so the whole show is about him finding out 
what happened, who did it, and then getting them. It's about him killing people who were responsible. In fact, the reality is it turns out the betrayal was far worse than you could have imagined. And so, yes, he goes aggro big time. And so here's, it's very violent. You know, people being killed and it's, and then not in a nice way, you know, although I don't know how you can kill people in a nice way. But uh, it's, um, it's very violent. And, you know, we're, we're not supposed to like violence and vengeance like that. And yet the show is very popular. Why is it so popular? Well, you know, the interesting thing is there's a lot of movies whose theme is revenge. It's, it's about getting back at people who've done evil. Why are those things so popular? I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, what was the first movie that I could remember that had that theme? And I, I had to go back a long way to get to that first one. And it was one that wasn't violent particularly. It was the movie The Sting. Have you seen, remember The Sting? It was very clever, but the whole point of the plot was to get back at someone who had done evil. We see that over and over again. Why is that? Well, it's because... All of us have been hurt. We've gone through life. We've been treated unfairly, it feels like, a lot of the time. Sometimes it may not even be specific people. It just feels like somehow we have not been treated the way we should have. And the result of that is we're hurt and we're angry. And we have this desire to have the scales tipped, have it become more even to get back. In other words, there's this visceral hurt and anger inside of all of us that wants revenge on something, someone. Sometimes it's very specific, sometimes it's not, but it's there. And that's why these movies seem to resonate with people. Deep down inside of us, that eye for an eye and tooth for tooth feels very right. You know, we live in a nation that is a nation of laws, and that's a good thing. It's actually been a thing that has been unusual throughout the history of the human race. Uh, we believe in due process for people who are accused, and so we don't believe in vigilante justice. And yet, our entertainment says, we may not believe in it, but we feel it. So the question is, how, how do you deal with it what is the right, right way to respond when you're truly hurt by someone? Well, you know what? You see it in sports all the time. Someone does something you know, wrong or illegal or hurtful to someone, and how do they respond? Well, they retaliate. And then the person they got retaliated against retaliates right back, and the next thing you know, it's a fight. That's what retaliation always leads to. And the thing is, it's not, not just in sports, it's in all of our relationships happens in marriage even. You know, uh, being married for almost 43 years, I have learned an important lesson, and that is that uh, failing to listen to my wife is usually a mistake. You know, it's always it's like, yeah, I think I know better. But, I, you know, Lori seems to have a, a brilliant ability to anticipate the consequences of actions. And it's amazing to me how many times she'll say, uh, uh, Rick, I don't think that's the best way to do that. And I'll think, well, I know what I'm doing. I know better than she. And I go right ahead. And sure enough, she's right. And I mess something up. And I regret it uh, because it ends badly, just like she cautioned that it would. And there have been occasions, it doesn't happen a lot, because Lori is really gracious, but every now and then, you know, when I do this, it kind of tries her patience, and she'll have this sort of impatient tone. She's, she'll say, Rick, I told you not to do that. Why did you do that? One of the interesting things I've noticed is just that impatient tone of voice is enough to trigger. You know, it's like, well... I want to shoot back. And the problem is I've got no ammunition. <laughs> you know, you want to, you're impatient with me. Well, I want to be impatient back with you, you know, but, but you were right and I was wrong and I have no defense. So, you know, all you can do is come up with some brilliant barb with like, well, 
you eat Fruit Loops, you know, or something like that. Uh, you know, Fruit Loops have been banned in six countries. Did you know that? And Lori loves them. So there you go. Yeah, now we're even. <laughs> yeah, you know. But it's that, that feeling that happens in relationships, even in little ways, that desire to just snap back. Um, Paul says, don't do it. Do not repay anyone ever evil for evil. In fact, in some translations, New American Standard, um, New Living will say, never, never repay back evil for evil, ever. Um, we should take note of the fact that what Paul wanted us to avoid is giving back evil. When someone has done something that has hurt us, there's, that has done damage to us, there is a sense in which that's evil. Evil um, is that which is morally wrong, harmful, uh, or injurious. That's what the dictionary says. What is evil? It's morally wrong, injurious, or harmful. Anytime someone does something to us that injures us, that harms us, even if they have a good excuse, it's evil because God doesn't want that. He always wants us to love. And so Paul says the problem for us is when someone is unkind to us, they speak to us in a harsh tone of voice, they're unfair, they mistreat us, they attack us, that's evil. And he says, by definition, it, if you turn around and do the same thing back, what are you doing? You are also doing evil. You're giving evil back for evil. Paul says, never, never, never give back evil for evil. All over the world, there are wars, there are conflicts of all kinds, and they start because someone does something hurtful or wrong, and in their hurt, the victim shoots back, and now the war is on. Paul says we need to do something radical. We need to refuse to give in to that powerful urge for revenge whether it be hurtful words, tone of voice, unkindness, outright mistreatment, we are not to give back that same evil. It's contrary to one of the most basic of human instincts. We fear if we don't do that, we're going to be walked on, we're going to be taken advantage of. Paul says, no, don't worry about that. God says it's always right. In every situation we will ever face, it is always right to love. That is the response to everything that happens to us. That's God's will. Um, you know, I find myself, this is kind of funny, one of the curses of being a pastor is I often find myself when I'm taking a shower thinking about a sermon that's coming up, you know? It's like, ah, uh, you never quite get away from it. So uh, recently I was thinking about this sermon while I was taking a shower I got out of the shower, I'm in the bathroom, and all of a sudden, the bathroom fixtures began speaking to me. <laughs> you know, you've lost your mind. I'm just kidding. But I, at a re I realized that there's some things about the bathroom fixtures that kind of come into play here. <laughs> One of the things that really comes into play is a mirror. You know, mirrors, mirrors are very unoriginal. You know, they don't create anything. All they do is reflect back the light that hits them. And so they reflect back the, the mirror, the image that, that strikes them. And it occurs to me that what Paul is talking about is our tendency is to be mirrors. We give back to people what they give to us. We're just reflecting what hits us. And so if it's kindness, we give back kindness. If it's love, we give back love. If it's harshness, we give back harshness. If it's impatience, we give back impatience. And that's returning evil for evil. Rather than being mirrors, we're still talking about bathroom fixtures here, we should be like faucets. You know, a faucet this is a more noble thing than a mirror because it has a supply of something that gives regardless of how you treat it. You know, the faucet is going to give you water. You can be mean to it. You can be unkind to it. It still gives water. You can be very kind to it very loving, praising it, still gives water. No matter what you do to it, it gives water. What Paul is saying is we're to be like faucets, not mirrors. 
we're to be filled with God's grace and his love and his kindness to the point that no matter what people do to us, all they're ever going to get is God's love and his kindness and his grace. We're not mirrors. We're not reflecting back what they show us. We're giving back what God has put into us. And that is our response in every situation. So we start with that. We say, nope, not going to give back evil for evil. Second thing that Paul tells us we should do here is choose peace. If it is possible, he says in verse 18, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. God wants us to choose peace with people. You know, have you ever known people, and I've known a few, who just seem to prefer conflict? They just look for ways to fight with people, to create turmoil and drama. Paul says, that's not really what we're here to do. God wants us to choose peace, to be at peace with people. Um, you know, I've often heard uh, people talk about how marriage uh, is hard work and how married people need to learn how to fight. And I've always thought that was interesting uh, because actually um, Lori and I, uh, this is going to sound a little weird, but we don't have a lot of conflicts. Um, and I've decided that maybe that's just because we've gotten too old and we just don't care anymore. It's just too hard. To, we're too tired to fight. But it's really more than that because we've always kind of been like that. Now, part of the reason for that is that we're very much alike. And so we think alike on a lot of things. So we don't, we're not butting heads a lot. Um, but there's another factor that I think is more important. And the factor is this. Um, we treasure each other so much. And we treasure our, the unity and the love we have so much that that becomes a greater good to us than anything we might fight about. So anything we might have a conflict over, we're willing to, you know, we're happy to be open and talk and be honest with each other and, and face what's really there. But the reality is those things don't matter to us nearly as much as expressing love to each other. And that really reduces the level of the conflict. It even reduces the amount of conflict because a lot of times, like, well, you want this and I want that, but we don't really care. What I care is that you feel loved, and that's what I'm going to pursue. And that really is kind of what Paul's talking about here. When he says choose peace, um, he's saying we should be valuing peace and loving people above getting our way, and it's always getting our way that is what is the source of conflict every time. Now, I realize that could be a recipe for conflict avoidance, but that's not really the point. Sometimes loving means, often loving means dealing with the conflict and getting it dealt with and get out of the way. But uh, it's saying, I'm valuing this person and loving this person more than something else that might be a lesser good, something that I want. Now, it's important to notice the words, if it is possible. They're very important. That's because it's not always going to be possible. There are people that you're just not going to be able to live at peace with. Um, there was a story out in the news uh, a couple of years ago about a man who was arrested in, back in Florida, in Lee County, Florida. His name was Justin Anthony Garcia. He was charged with aggravated battery. And the story is pretty amazing. Um, seemed that he and his cousin got into an argument over whether almond milk is superior to whole milk. And the argument became more and more heated until finally Garcia became so enraged at his cousin that he punched him in the head. And then his, his cousin hit back, fought back, and then Garcia pulled out a knife. And, and then at that point, his cousin started to run away, not before suffering some cuts from the knife. They got in a life-threatening fight over almond milk. You're not always going to be able to be at peace with people like that, you know? That, that says there's a, there's a problem there. So we need to recognize it's not in our control always. But 
here's a way to think about, you know, peace, when there's absence of peace, there's conflict. When there's conflict, there needs to be resolution and, and reconciliation, particularly reconciliation. I want you to think about reconciliation. If you think two people, and reconciliation is in the middle, where each of them has to come to, to for true reconciliation to happen. In order for reconciliation to happen, there has to be something that happens on each side of that middle point. There has to be repentance and there has to be forgiveness. So in other words, let's imagine, for instance, that one person is repentant. They say, you know what? I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? That's a contribution they need to make for reconciliation to happen. But there has to be another contribution from the other side for reconciliation to happen. And that is, that person needs to say, I forgive you. So in order for there to be um, true unity, resolution, reconciliation, both sides need to contribute that kind of thing. And there needs to be the repentance on one side, forgiveness on the other. If there is forgiveness on the one side, someone saying, well, you know what, I forgive you but there's no repentance on the other side. The person saying, well, there was nothing to forgive because I did nothing wrong. There will be no reconciliation. So here's the thing. Paul says, as far as possible, as it depends upon you, key words, as it depends upon you, all you can do is give your side. You can forgive or you can repent, but you can't make the other person do their part and if they don't do their part, there will be no reconciliation. So Paul says we have to recognize that peace is something that we don't completely control. All we control is our side of it. And that's what we need to make sure we do. Because Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. So we're going to value peace, and we're going to give our part. We're going to do everything we can to be at peace with other people. In order to help us do that, then, there's another thing that Paul says we need to do in our relationships with people when there's potential hurt, and that is we need to leave room. Uh, don't take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. You know, like I mentioned, we've been taking care of our, our grandparents daughters this weekend, our three granddaughters, and um, we've tried to go on, or not tried to, but we've gone on a couple of outings with them, and that has presented a, a real challenge for us. Uh, we have a, a Nissan Rogue, which is a small SUV. Now, most of the time, it's just very fine, but there is a complicating factor. The, the, word, the operant word there is small. Uh, you know, there are many SUVs that you see out on the road now or family vans that are just slightly smaller than an aircraft carrier, you know, <laughs> and they don't seem to have a problem. They're, they're no problems, but the, the problem comes in in that, you know, um, well, this is something that people who are of a certain age, like me and Lori, can remember days growing up when, you know, you fell asleep in the back of the station wagon, you know, lay it out and you could just sleep back there. Or you remember riding in the back of a car and not only did you not wear seat belts, there weren't even any seat belts in the back seat of the car, you know. So, and somehow, amazingly, we survived. <laughs> Against all, the, all odds, we managed to, to avoid the carnage of the, free, the highways. And, but these days... That doesn't happen because kids have to be buckled into car seats, right? And those car seats have been uh, developed, I believe, by NASA <laughs> to keep those kids safe on their rigorous and dangerous journey through space. And you have to be an engineer to install the kid in this car seat. It's just like, OK, we've got to put three kids in the, in the car and car seats well, this is going to take about two hours, you know, and the, the buckles and the, and the, you know, and it goes on and on. But the, the real killer is that when you have a small SUV and there's three car seats, the other thing about these car seats is they're enormous. 
And so what's happened is trying to put three of them in the back seat, there's not room for poor Ella, who has gotten old enough that she doesn't have to have one of the big, huge things. She just got this little booster seat. But she gets squeezed in. We haven't, there's no room for her because the huge car seats are taking up all the room. Why am I talking about that? Well, because there's something else that gets squeezed out by something that's enormous. And the thing that gets squeezed out by our desire to get even is God's wrath. God says, look, I know you're hurt by this person. I've got this. And we say, yeah, not good enough, Lord. I'm going to take care of this myself. And we squeeze out God's wrath. Now, I know there are people who don't really like the idea of God having wrath. But let me share a couple of uh, quotes. Yale professor Miroslav Volf, in his book, Free of Charge, said at one time he was appalled at the idea of God having wrath. He thought it was barbaric. But then he witnessed the horrors, the atrocities, and the brutality of war in his native country, Yugoslavia. He wrote this, though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being loved. God is wrathful because God is love. Theologian N.T. Wright says, if God does not hate racial prejudice, he's neither good nor loving. If God is not wrathful at child abuse, he is neither good nor loving. If God is not utterly determined to root out from his creation the arrogance that allows people to exploit, bomb, bully, and enslave one another, he is neither good, loving, nor wise. Yeah, God to be good, God to be loving, God to be wise must deal with evil, and he will he says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will take care of it. I've got this. So you can sit this one out. You know, one of the things I have found humorous is how uh, quickly young children, one or two years old, figure out what a remote is for. <laughs> you ever notice that? You know, they, they know, they quickly, you know, they get the idea. They want to watch TV. They pick up the remote and they aim it at the TV. You know, it's, ah, the magic device. It's but it's not working. You know, and just this last week, you know, uh, Wesley picked up the remote and he wants to watch TV and he's aiming at the TV, but he doesn't know how to turn it on. He doesn't know how to work the buttons. Uh, he just knows that somehow aiming this instrument at the TV makes it work, and so he picked it up and I said. Wesley, do you want to watch TV? He says, yes, watch Mickey House. <laughs> Means he wants to watch the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse TV show. And I said, well, would you like me to turn it on for you? Yeah, sure. That's what he says. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, yeah, pa. Uh, yeah, papa. And so I said, well, why don't you give me the remote? And he hands it over very quickly. And I click the buttons, and it comes on, and everybody's happy. Why am I talking about that? Well, because I want you to think about wrath as the remote. And we think, we think we can control it. So we pick up that remote of wrath and we aim it around at people and we're going to get back at them. And God says, you know what? You don't know how to work that thing. Why don't you let me take it? Because I can do it in ways that you can't. This is actually the remedy for the violence in the world. You know, people get so uh, hyper about, oh, I, wrath, we hate the idea of wrath and violence. And, uh, you know what? What saves us from that is the fact that God will bring justice. You know, there are some psalms that when you read them, they really can cause some heartburn. Uh, one of them is Psalm 109, and David wrote that psalm. We don't know when he wrote it, but he was in a lot of pain. He was hurting because of what people were doing. He was being mistreated and abused, and that happened to him a lot in his life, so he knew what he was talking about. 
And he talks about that in the verse, first five verses in the, of the psalm about how people were mistreating him. But I want you to listen to verses 9 through 12 of Psalm 109. This is what he wants for the person that has done him wrong. He says, may his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined homes. May a creditor seize all he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his labor. May no one extend kindness to him or take pity on his fatherless children. Well, now, there is some heartwarming stuff. And then to have your devotions in that passage, you go, yeah, that's really warm and fuzzy. Yikes! You read this and you think, that's horrible. May his children be fatherless. In other words, may he die. And may his children become homeless. And may no one show any pity on his children whatsoever. You think, whoa, David, a little bit of a volcano, are we? You know, kind of erupting here, buddy. Um, do you know what? Why, why is that in the Psalms? Because the Psalms are really nitty-gritty stuff. They're real. They're very real. And David is pouring out his pain here. He's expressing what he really feels. He has been deeply hurt, and he is angry, and he wants that person to pay. But here's the critical thing. What is he doing with that? He's leaving room for the wrath of God. He's saying, this is what I'm feeling, and I'm giving it to you, Lord. Uh, these are the things I want to happen, but it's up to you to decide what happens. He's doing the exact right thing by trusting God with his hurt. Psalm 98, verse 9 says, The Lord comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Psalm 9, 7 says, The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. God will deal with it. His justice is true justice. Ours can't really be trusted to be fair. <coughs> was watching a, a baseball game on television. And you know they've come up with a new uh, cool technological improvement for TV broadcasts for, of baseball. They actually can put a, a little box, rectangle, right up on the screen that shows you the strike zone. So you can tell instantly whether a pitch is a ball or a strike. It's so cool. And you can see this umpire has no clue because he's missing that pitch over and over again. But here's the thing that I found interesting. I saw it happen with Manny Machado this week, you know, um, watching, and he gets, there's two strikes on him, and here comes this pitch, and it's low, and it's inside, and the pitch, the umpire rings him up, strike three, you're out, and Machado is furious. He knew that pitch was not a strike. One problem, it was. It didn't look like a strike to him, but you could see on the screen, just, it caught the very corner of the strike zone. It was a strike, but it didn't feel like it to him because he's not objective about that. We're not objective about things that hurt us, ever. And so we can't really trust our sense of justice because it's not always right. It's kind of selfishly tweaked. But God is always just. Furthermore, not only is God always just and his justice is always reliable, it is unfailing because God is all-powerful. There is nothing that is outside of his control. And here's the thing that really sets us free. Because God is just and because God is omnipotent, no one will ever get away with anything. Ever. Ever. There is not one single thing that people, that anyone has ever done to hurt another human being that they will not have to answer to God for. And that's the thing that really brings us some hope because you know what? There are going to be a lot of times in our lives where people are going to hurt us and there's not a thing we can do to fix it. But here's the cool thing. We can do what David did. Pour it out to God and know that that person will have to answer to him and God will take care of it. 
renowned Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann said, the raw speech of rage can be submitted to Yahweh because there is reason for confidence that Yahweh takes it serious and will act. That's what David did. Left room for the wrath of God because God will deal with it, and God will deal with it far more effectively than David ever could have. So if we're leaving room for the wrath of God, then what should we do? What, what action should we take? Well, Paul tells us at the end of the passage, here's what we should do. Win the battle. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, do not be overcome by evil, he says, but overcome evil with good. We need to define what winning means for us in life. What does it mean? It isn't making sure that someone who hurt us ends up being hurt at least as badly as, as we've been hurt. Winning for us means having good win out. When good wins, God's kingdom wins, and that's the goal. And so what we should be doing is saying, I want, I want good to win because when I return evil for evil, when I give back to them what they've given to me, all I've done by that is added to the sum total of evil in the world. I haven't caused more good to happen. I've just caused more evil to happen. Well, okay, how do I make good uh, win? Well, it's not rocket science. He made good win by doing good. Pretty easy. He actually, Paul had actually started that idea way back in uh, verse 14, uh, where he said, uh, bless those who persecute you. Somebody does evil to you, bless them. Okay, well, bless, what does that mean? Dictionary says it means to bestow good of any kind on a person. That's what it means to bless someone. So someone treats you badly, they persecute you, they're unkind to you, what should you do? Bestow good of any kind on that person, and you're blessing them. And Paul gives some examples. Your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Try to meet his needs, whatever they may be. Uh, Yahoo News a few years back carried a story about four police officers back in Pennsylvania. Um, there were two white officers and two African-American officers, and they were at a diner, and they're having dinner together, the four of them, and a couple, hostess brought a couple, the couple had come into the restaurant, and hostess brought them to sit at a table next to them, and the couple said, we don't want to sit near, we don't want to sit near them. Well, that's kind of hurtful, I don't want to be sitting next to those police officers. Um, so the hostess seated them somewhere else, and one of the officers, Chuck Thomas, happened to look at the man, just they made eye contact, and he could see, he could see the, the venom in the guy's gaze at him. How do you deal with that? Well, uh, Chuck and his fellow officers had a very wise response. They didn't say a thing to the couple. They just picked up their dinner tab without a word, left them a nice note, and paid their bill. They returned good for evil. They blessed those who persecuted them. That's what Paul's talking about. Peter Miller was a pastor in the town of Ephrata, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, way back in the time of the American Revolution. And he was a good friend, actually, of General George Washington, personal friend. Uh, there was a man who lived in this town who was a very spiteful person who hated Miller and did everything he could to oppose him and to make his life miserable. Well, uh, turns out that this guy, his name was uh, Whitman, uh, was a really kind of a hard case who caused trouble for people in general, including those who were favoring the revolution, and he ended up getting arrested for treason. And he was actually tried and convicted and sentenced to death. Well, Pastor Miller, upon learning this, walked 70 miles to talk to General George Washington personally. And he actually went and appealed 
for a pardon for Whitman's life. George Washington said to him, you know, Peter, I'm very sorry, but I cannot grant you the life of your friend. And Miller said, my friend? He's not my friend. In fact, he's the most bitter enemy I have. And Washington was shocked. And after a few moments, he said, you know, I can't believe you walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy. But in light of that, I'm going to grant you your pardon. And that day, Whitman walked back to their hometown with Miller, a free man and a changed man, because Miller had returned good for evil. Paul says by, um, by doing this, you'll heap burning coals upon someone's head. Uh, it's kind of an interesting image, isn't it? It's like, hey, if you really want to make them hurt, do this, you know? And that's kind of what it sounds like. That's the way to really get vengeance. But um, C.E.B. Cranfield, a great British scholar, said that he agrees with Augustine and many early scholars, which basically this is an image of causing them to experience real regret and shame over what they've done. That's really the point. He's saying, you know, if you really want to get to someone who's really been cruel and mean, here's the way to do it. Give them good. Bless them. Return kindness for evil. So what do we do with all of this? Well, this is a radical way of living. It's completely contrary to the impulses of the human nature. You know, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. This is completely different than that. So the question is, what, what are some things we can do to help us carry this out? Because it's going to be hard. It's not natural. So what, what can we do to help us with this? Well, first thing we can do is live for God, God's kingdom, not ours. We always need to think about, why am I here on the planet? You know, am I here just to make myself comfortable and to protect myself and promote myself and make my life better? Or am I here for something greater? And obviously, we've seen in the book of Rev, uh, Romans that we're here for something greater. We're here for God's kingdom, for his glory. And that's going to mean taking our, our eyes off of ourselves and looking to how can I build God's kingdom. And we need to remember this. God is good. In fact, he is pure good. He is unadulterated good, 100% good. And wherever he rules... There is only good. A kingdom is a place where a king rules. And so God's kingdom is a place where good rules. If we're living for God's kingdom, if God's kingdom is within us, God is ruling in our lives, what is that going to produce? Good, always, no matter what happens. And we're going to be focused on what I want is God's kingdom to grow. When I am hurt by others, I'm not here primarily, primarily to protect myself, comfort myself, uh, get back. I'm here to promote God's kingdom, and that's what I want to do here by doing good. So that's the first thing. Second thing is we need to remember how to win. You know, it's funny. You'll hear I've heard this a lot from professional athletes about teams. There's an interesting thing you'll notice about teams that have been bad and they become better, uh, but they usually don't go and win a championship in their first year, they're better. And professional athletes will say a lot, that's because teams need to learn how to win. And that I've always thought, well, that's kind of ridiculous, you know? I mean, they've been playing the, this sport all their lives and they have to learn how to win. Learning how to win is easy. You score more than the other guy and you win, right? That's it. So what are they saying? Well, they're saying there's some things that go into actually becoming a championship team. You only learn by going through hardship, by learning how to do the hard work, learning how to prepare, learning how to do the little things, learning how to perform when the pressure is on. That's what they mean when they talk about learning how to win. And for us, we have to think about, OK, what does it mean for me to win? Oh, right. It means not returning evil for evil, but returning good for evil. 
I have to learn that's what winning is. It's like, oh, you know what? It's dark outside. Oh, well, how do you fix that? Well, you turn off lights, make it darker. Yeah, it's returning evil for evil. How do we turn on the lights in the darkness of this world? We do good. And we only learn that by being in the difficult situations and saying, okay, now I'm faced with how do I decide what to do in this situation when I'm so tempted to shoot back? I got to try to win. And I win by overcoming evil with good. So that's critical. And the last thing we can do that can really help us is look at Jesus. The best example of winning in all of history was Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us to fix our eyes on him. No one has ever been given more evil than Jesus. And how did he respond? By giving us the most costly good, the best good that anyone could ever have. Keep our eyes on him. He went to the cross for us. Are we willing to do the same for others? You know, when Lori and I first moved into our home, we live there now um, going on 32 years. Um, there, the, there's a house, our next door house, the next house next door to us on the west of our house was interesting early on. Uh, and that was because we had a series of very interesting neighbors in, in that house. The first uh, people were the original owners. There was an older couple that lived there. And they were, I was pretty sure they were either a Russian sleeper agent couple or they were maybe in the witness protection program because when we talked to them and got to know them a little bit, they gave us different names when they introduced themselves. It was Herb, it was Bill, it was Shirley, it was Louise. It was like, okay, what's going on here? Who are these people? But anyway, that was a little weird. They weren't there very long, and then I, I'm pretty sure the witness protection program moved them to some other company because they, they moved out. And then the next couple that lived there, a uh, young couple, wife was fine, husband was a problem. Uh, he was a problem because he was a very, very self-obsessed person, and he had an explosive temper that was scary. Uh, he had a number of really scary interactions with some of our neighbors. And, of course, we had some friction with him. Because he was very difficult to get along with. Well, it kind of culminated in the day when uh, he kicked our dog, and Lori witnessed this. And Lori was furious at him, man, and she went after him. I was afraid she was going to get in a fight with this guy, and we was nearly twice her size. Um, fortunately, that didn't happen. But the next day, she said, I feel terrible about that. This guy was difficult. Uh, he was a little scary. He was not someone you like to be around a lot, and he had done something that was really pretty ugly. And Lori's response to that situation was she baked an apple pie for that guy, and she went over to their house and knocked on their door. He wouldn't even come to the door to talk to her, but his wife did. And Laurie said, I feel bad about the, the problem we had yesterday and about how I responded to it. And I want him to know, I want Joe to know that I'm sorry. And I brought baked this pie as an apology. Would you give it to him and give him my apologies? Completely changed the situation. All of a sudden, the thaw began in our relationship with them. Not long after that, we were, there was a brush fire that came and threatened our neighborhood, and we were ordered to evacuate. As we were getting, we were packing our car, we saw this couple, and they were outside their house, and we said, do you guys have some place to go? We're concerned about you. We're going over to my parents' house. We're going to stay there. Do you need a place so you can come with us? And they were touched because we were solicitous of their safety. We were reaching out to them, trying to be God's goodness to them. And ever after that, we never had another problem with that couple. Good defeated evil. 
They sold the house. We had a fine relationship. And then we got worse neighbors in there after that. But that's another story. So, so here's the thing. What we need to do is become winners. Winners for God's kingdom by always doing good, no matter what other people may do. Because that's when good wins. Let's pray. Father, um, we all struggle, as you know, and I'm, this is why you've given us these instructions. We all struggle with when people hurt us. We want to hit back. We want to fight back. We want to yell back. We want to get even. And we need to remember, Father, you've told us this morning very clearly, getting even isn't winning. Only winning is winning. And winning only happens when we give back good for evil. So, Lord, I pray this morning that you will fill us with your goodness, with your grace, with your love, with your kindness, that that will be what is in our hearts, that we will become like those faucets, that no matter what people do, when we are uh, confronted with any kind of situation, what is going to come out is your goodness, your love, your kindness, your grace, so that we can win and your kingdom can win. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with us and let's sing.
we praise you today and we thank you for your love, that you are the God of justice and peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for coming. Have a great week.